Shalom. Isaiah 10, roughly page 421 in the scriptures. Coffee. Woe to those making unrighteous inscriptions and writers who have prescribed toil to keep the needy back from right ruling and to take what is right from the poor of my people, that widows become their prey and orphans their plunder. What shall you do in the day of visitation and in the ruin which comes to, from afar? To whom would you run for help, and where would you leave your wealth? Without me, Yahuwah, they shall bow down among the prisoners and fall among the killed. And with all his displeasure has not turned back, and his hand is still stretched out. With all this, his displeasure has not turned back, and his hand is still stretched out. Outstretched hand, we've talked about that. <coughs> That's the yod the Hebrew letter Y, the little hand, it's Yeshua, the right hand of Yah. It's the redemption, the redeemer, the anointing, the relentless pursuit of a loving father. Even with all of this, your unrighteous prescriptions and the burdens that you heap upon people, the father has not turned back from you. He still reaches out for you. Woe to a shore, the rod of my displeasure, and the staff in whose hand is my displeasure. Against a defiled nation I send him, and against the people of my wrath I command him to seize the spoil, to take the prey, and to tread them down like the mud of the streets. But he does not intend so, nor does his heart think so, for it is in his heart to destroy, to cut off not a few nations. For he says, Are not my princes kings? Is not Kalno like Carchemish? Is not Hamath like Arpad? Is not Shomeron like Damasek? As my hand has found the reins of the idols, whose carved images excel those of Jerusalem and Shomeron, I have done to Shomeron and her idols. Do I not also do to Jerusalem and her idols? Idols in Jerusalem. <clears throat> That's why the king of Ashur is coming because Yah is using the king of Ashur to bring judgment upon his people. Thou shalt not worship idols, no idolatry. But Yah's people aren't doing his stuff anymore, so he's going to let the world whoop their butt just a little bit so that uh, they'll get the message and turn back to him. Interesting concept. Can I bring you closer? I can. Fabulous. And it shall be when Yahuwah has performed all his work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem that I shall punish the fruit of greatness of the heart of the king of Ashur and the boasting of his haughty looks. For he has said, by the power of my hand, I have done it. And by, by my wisdom, for I have been clever. <clears throat> and I remove the boundaries of the people and have robbed their treasures. And I put down the inhabitants like a strong one. Yeah, by my hand, I have done it. Remember, What's the reason Moshe, Moses can't go into the promised land? Because the father said, speak to the rock and water shall come out of it. Don't strike it. And what does Moshe do? He strikes the rock with the staff and water comes forth. And he, and he says, look what we, Moses and Aaron, look what we have done for you. Not look what Yah has done for you. He's pissed. He lets his anger get the best of him. And he smashes the rock with his staff. And he's like, look what I've done for you. No, it was Yah's power. Just like the king of Ashur here, um, by the power of my hand, I have done it. Negative. Right? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, is the mediator, the intercessor in between us and Yah. Yet yeah, there's power in his name. There's power in Yeshua's name because Yah will put his name in him. Yah is the ultimate source of power. And so... We have to remember this as well. I'm not I'm not a preterist. I'm not a, a what will be will be. I'm a Yah's will will be. And I want to be in line with what Yah's will is. Because if I can fall in line with his will, then I'll experience blessings. And if I'm outside of his will, 
that I'll experience the opposite of blessings, what some would call curses. But uh, I don't think everything is predestined. I think Yah's will is going to be made done, and you're going to participate in it or you're not. And if you participate in it, <coughs> excuse me, you'll be blessed. But it's by his power and authority that these things get done, not by yours. So you might be participatory. This goes into Matthew 7, 21. The uh, believers, air quote, believers in Messiah saying, Master, Master, have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and done many mighty works in your name? And truly, truly, I shall say unto them, depart from me, you who work lawlessness, you who work lawlessness. Jesus says, get away from me, you lawless people, for I never knew you. Have we not done all this stuff in your name? Even the lawless can cast out demons and heal people and done many mighty works in the name of Yeshua, in the name of Jesus. Because the power is not in them. The power is in the name. And the reason there's power in his name is because Yahuwah or Yahuwah or Yahava or however you want to approach the yod heh vav -He, has put his name in the name of the Savior. Yeshua, Yahusha, Yahoshua. Salvation in Hebrew is his name. And we're not going to jump into that rabbit hole too hardcore. But it's not by your works. Or not by your power that these mighty works get done. It's by Yah's power. That's part of why your works done apart from Yah's will are like filthy menstrual rags, as uh, Rabbi Shaul would say. Yeah, because the works that you're capable of without Yah's will are but filthy menstrual rags. <laughs> Thank you for the second witness, Rooster. And my hand finds the riches of the people like a nest, and I have gathered all the earth like forsaken eggs are gathered. And there was no one who moved his wing nor opened his mouth even with a peep. Would the axe boast itself over him who chops with it? Or the saw exalt itself over him who saws with it? Is the tool greater than the craftsman who holds it? Is the point here. Like we, it's what we literally were just talking about, praise Yah. The power's not in the tool. It's in the hand of the craftsman who's holding it. You want to be a tool in Yah's toolkit. You don't want to be a tool of the world. Would the axe boast itself over him who chops with it, or the saw exalt itself over him who saws with it, as a rod waving those who lifts it up, as a staff lifting up that which is not wood? Therefore, the master Yahuwah of hosts, Yahuwah Sabaoth, sends leanness among his fat ones, and under his esteem he kindles a burning like the burning of a fire. And the light of Israel shall be for a fire, and his set-apart one for a flame. The light of Israel. What's the light of Israel? Do we need to go back to Proverbs again? Probably should know this off the top of my head, but I don't. Proverbs 6 23, for the command, <laughs> you're going to die today, bird, for the command is a lamp and the Torah is a light, for the command is a lamp and the Torah a light, Proverbs 6, 23, <clears throat> so if we believe in the 1977 codified church doctrine of inerrancy, meaning let's let the Bible interpret the Bible, which I think is a good thing, then uh, if we look at this here, verse 17, Isaiah 10, 17, and the light of Israel, the Torah, shall be for a fire, and the set-apart one for a flame. The set-apart one. Who's the set-apart one? Messiah. So Messiah... It's going to be like a flame of this fire that is the light of Israel. What's the light of Israel? The Torah. So here again, we have the linking of Mashiach, Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus, and the Torah. Boom. Again, inextricably tied. And by the way, Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, is the book. This is the book, the scroll that Yeshua 
Messiah himself quoted more often than any other book in the scriptures. Um, yeah. And in fact, I believe it's in Luke, after the resurrection, when he's walking down the street, Yeshua is, and he's talking with a couple of apostles, and the scales fall from their eyes, and they realize it's Yeshua, and he says to them, um, well, this was unplanned, but let's see exactly what he says to them. Acts, John, Luke. Here it is. Luke chapter 24. Ah, verse 15. And it came to be as they were talking and reasoning that Yeshua himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. They couldn't see that it was him. And he said to them, what are these words you're exchanging with each other as you're walking? And are you sad? And one whose name was Cleophas answered and said to him, are you the lone visitor in Jerusalem? Are you the only dude in this city who does not know what took place in these days? And Yeshua said to them, what? And he said to him, Cleophas said to him, concerning Yeshua of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before Elohim and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and impaled him. We, however, were expecting that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. What's Israel? Genesis 32. He who is striving with Elohim, he who is overcome with Elohim, and he who is ruling with Elohim. We, however, were expecting that this Yeshua of Nazareth, a prophet, was going to redeem Israel. But besides all this, today is the third day since these matters took place. But certain women of ours who arrived at the tomb early also astonished us when they did not find his body. And they came saying that they had also seen a vision of messengers, angels, who said he was alive. And some of those with us went to the tomb and found it, as also the women had said, but they did not see him. And he, Yeshua, said to them, O thoughtless ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Mashiach, Messiah, to suffer these and to enter into his esteem, his glory. This is Messiah ben Joseph. Half of the biblical prophecies of Messiah are what are called Messiah ben Joseph, the suffering servant. And of course, Yeshua, Mashiach, knew these prophecies. He was these prophecies. He embodied them, Matthew five seventeen. Was it not necessary for the Mashiach to suffer these and to enter into his high esteem? And beginning at Moshe and all the prophets, Yeshua was explaining to them in all the scriptures the matters concerning himself. <sighs> and beginning at Moses, that's where, see, that's where Yeshua started teaching them about Mashiach, was at Moses and all the prophets, including Isaiah. He was explaining to them all the matters concerning himself. It would beg the question, even if you don't feel led to keep the Torah yet, which is an obedience issue. It's not a salvation or a works-based salvation issue. It's an obedience issue to your bridegroom, Mashiach, Messiah, who was the embodied Torah and who you were commanded in the New Testament to walk after. Oh, yes, the New Testament has commands as well, by the way. Because these commands, the Hebrew literal translation is instructions. There is lots of instruction in the New Testament as well. But even if you are not convinced to keep the Torah yet, you should know Moses and the prophets like the back of your hand. Because all of these matters concern Messiah. And Yeshua himself taught his apostles about him, beginning with Moses and the prophets. And that's in the New Testament Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. So, for all you Sunday church-going New Testament Christians, hey, it's right there. What would Jesus do? He would teach his apostles Moses and the prophets. How do we know? Because Luke, the recorder, recorded it in his Gospel. So... 
back to Isaiah 10, 17. And the light of Israel, which is the Torah, Proverbs 22, 6. And the light of Israel shall be for fire. I'm sorry, 6, 22. <laughs> Got it backwards. And it shall burn and devour his weeds and his thorn bushes in one day. Yeah. The set apart one. And it shall burn and devour his weeds and his thorn bushes in one day, separating the wheat from the chaff. So this fire that's going to separate the wheat from the chaff is the Torah. The set apart one, Messiah, separates the wheat from the chaff with the Torah. Matthew 7, 21. Depart from me, you who work lawlessness. I never knew you. <laughs> It's a little different Bible channel around here. Matthew, Isaiah 10, 17. Sorry, making a note in my Bible. It's a, uh, yeah, a little more organic today. Isaiah 10, 17. By the way, I write all in my Bible all the time. So, and these are, these are not pre-planned studies that I do either. There's no notes. There's no, there's no nothing. Just a little conversation with the Father before you and I get started and then read the Word and as the Spirit moves, the Spirit moves. And the light of Israel, the Torah, shall be for a fire, and the set-apart one, Messiah, for a flame. And the flame, the set-apart one, the fire, the Torah, shall burn and devour his weeds and his thorn bushes in one day. Wheat and chaff, wheat and chaff. And consume the esteem of his forest and his fertile field, both life and flesh. And they shall be as when a sick man wastes away. He who seeks to save his life shall lose it, but he who seeks to lose his life shall find it. Yeshua, right? And the remaining trees of his forest shall be so few in number that a child records them, that the child could count them. How many, and I've been saying this for a long time, a remnant is not two billion people. How many people made it onto the Ark of Noah? Eight. Eight. That was the remnant of Noah. It was uh, in the New Testament. You can see there's 144,000 virgins. They're maidens. Um, 144,000. That means these are children below the age of marrying. So let's say they're part of a, it's tough to put a number to, but we're talking maybe a million people or so. They're part of families, maybe a couple million people. I don't know. What's cool is there's globally right now, this prophesied awakening of the completeness of understanding of the Old Testament and the New Testament. There's millions of people waking up around the globe right now to this understanding. It's a beautiful thing. And in that day, it shall be that the remnant of Israel and those who have escaped the house of Jacob never again lean upon him who struck them, but shall lean upon Yahuwah, the set-apart one of Israel, in truth. Yahuwah, the set-apart one of Israel. A remnant shall return, a remnant of Jacob, to the mighty Elohim. For though your people, O Israel, be as the sand of the sea, yet a remnant of them shall return. A decisive end, overflowing with righteousness. What's righteousness? Luke 1, verse 6, blamelessly walking in the commands of Yah. For the master, Yahuwah of hosts, Yahuwah Sabaoth, is making a complete end, as decided in the midst of all the earth. Therefore, thus said the master, Yahuwah of hosts, My people who dwell in Zion shall not be afraid of Ashur, who struck you with the rod and lifts up his staff against you in the way of Mitzrayim. For yet a little while, and the displeasure shall be completed, and my displeasure be their destruction. And Yahuwah of hosts stirs up a lash for him as a smiting of Midian as the rock of Oreb. And as his rod was on the sea, so shall he lift it up in the way of Mitzrayim. 
And in that day it shall be that his burden is removed from your shoulder and his yoke from your neck, and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing oil. And he has come upon Iath, and he has passed Migron, and his yoke, this yoke, imagine this, the yoke of Ashur, the king of Ashur, who is uh, putting them to the sword and destroying them because Yahuwah has permitted it per Israel's unrighteousness. His yoke, this king of Ashur, shall be destroyed because of the anointing oil. What is the anointing oil used for? To set apart, to dedicate things unto Yah. This means that there has been a teshuva, a changing of heart of these people, that they are turning back to Yah. They're being anointed, and the oil is dripping down off of their head and through their beard, and they're, they're awash in the spirit of Yah. They've teshuvahed. Their heart has turned back to their creator. And because of this change of heart, which the heart steers the whole ship, right? The heart informs the mind and the hands, which is why you have to have the law written on your heart, in your mind, on your heart. That's why the mark is on your forehead or in your hand, because it's reflective of what's in your heart, right? Um, and it's interesting because, you know, New Testament Christians will say, well, the law was done away with. Well, and the, and the temple's in here, brother. The temple's in here in your heart. Roger that. What was at the center of the temple? Anybody remember? What was at the center of the tabernacle? The Ark of the Covenant. What's the Ark? It's a protective case for what? The witness, the two tablets of the Father's perfect law. So at the very center of the temple is the Father's law. The law, and he sat upon the ark. He sat upon the ark like a throne, Yahuwah did. So he was seated upon the law. Father Yah was firmly fixed upon the law that he established for you and I forever. I'm the Lord Yahuwah Sabaoth, I change not, Malachi 3 verse 6. And so, again, New Testament Christianity, Hebrews 8, read the renewed covenant, the renewed covenant, Hebrews 8, which is so new that it comes from the Old Testament prophet of Jeremiah, yeah, verse, uh, chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. Yeah, that's how new that new covenant is, so that it's word for word copied from the prophet Jeremiah out of the Old Testament. Uh, so there's nothing new about it, BT dubs. That New Testament renewed covenant requires that the Father's law be in your mind and written on your heart, and then you will be his people, and he will be your Elohim, and he will remember your sins and your lawlessness no more. <sighs> But at the center of that temple is the Father's law. At the center of the tabernacle was the ark, which covered up, protected the Father's law, which he was seated upon. At the center of the temple in Jerusalem was the ark of the witness, which contained the tablets of stone, which was the Father's law. It's to be in the very center, the very heart of you, as close to your inward parts as possible. And so these people have had a change in their heart. They've turned their heart back towards the Father. And so because of the anointing oil, this yoke, this burden of this foreign king who is slaughtering them has turned away from them. That yoke has been broken because of this anointing oil. He has come upon Iath and he passed Migron. At Mikmash, he stored his supplies. They have gone through the pass. They've taken up lodging at Giva. Rama is afraid, and Giva of Shaul has fled. Lift up your voice, O daughter of Galim. Listen, Laisha, O poor Anatoth. Madmana has fled. The inhabitants of Gebim sought refuge. Yet he remains at Nob that day. He shakes his fist at the mountains of the daughters of Zion, the hill of Jerusalem. Look, the master, Yahuwah of hosts, is lopping off a branch with an awesome crash. And the tall ones are cut down, and the lofty ones are laid low. And he shall cut down the thickets of the forest with iron, and Lebanon shall fall as a mighty one. Isaiah chapter 10. Bless y'all. Shalom.